Matt Taibbi drops by to talk about the Iraq War anniversary and politics in general. It's fascinating. Check it out. Leave your comments. Ding the bell and subscribe. Matt Taibbi, he's a contributing editor to Rolling Stone, author of five books, and including his latest, I Can't Breathe, The Killing on Bay Street. Uh, his website is Hate Incorporated, and uh, his Twitter handle is M Taibbi, M-T-A-I-B-B-I, or at, at Rolling Stone also. Matt, welcome back to the program. Thanks for having me, Tom. It's always nice talking with you, Matt. And, it, you yeah. know, it's, it's always great reading your stuff. You've got two articles here uh, that I think are absolutely fascinating that I wanted to talk with you about. Um, the first is the Scarlet Letter Club, how the, the, the people who lied us into the Iraq War are still around and still doing this kind of stuff. And the second right. is uh, how to blow $700 billion. It's easier than you think about how we're being ripped off by the Defense Department. Uh, where do you want to start? Um, well, I'm, I'm going to the, the Scarlet Letter Club piece is something that I'm doing uh, as part of that serial book, Hate Inc., and that's that's on uh, taibi.substack.com. And I, ha okay. I have another piece on that coming out in Rolling Stone today, so that we, we should probably start there. But it's, okay. it's apropos. There is kind of an intersection between the two, isn't there? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. No, I mean, it, well, one sort of fed the other, uh, and um, that was a, that was the turning point, actually in in the whole history of what we were going to do with the defense budget because if people forget now in the 90s there was all this talk of a peace dividend and you know we were no longer going to have to spend all this money because the soviets were gone and the iraq war sent us back on a schedule of continually ascending defense budgets right so uh who you know who brought us the iraq war and 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 how do we prevent that from happening again? Being lied into a war by a president. It seems to me that we're about to be lied into a war in Venezuela and maybe Iran by Donald Trump as as his reelection ploy, much as you know George W. Bush told his his biographer Inky Hertzwitz in 1999 that if he became president, he was going to have a war with Iraq in order to get reelected. Right. I mean, I, I think you you could accurately you could also characterize it as. You know, we have regime change plans that that have re really the playbook that we started with in, in Iraq has repeated itself over and over again. Um, it, you know, in multiple arenas, L Libya was one. It's now going on in in um, in Venezuela. Obviously, uh, the situation is a little more complicated in Syria, but but the um you know the the archetype the for all this was the Iraq campaign and what's so amazing about this you know cuz i looked at it mainly from the standpoint of journalists and how how we screwed up the story it, you know a legend has emerged since then that the error was that we believed the intelligence that that or Saddam Hussein had WMDs whereas you know we now know that WMDs was really an excuse that was kind of cooked up post factum in British American negotiations to give the British political cover. The real reason is we just feel like regime change is is, is the appropriate foreign policy right. um, for in the post Soviet universe, and 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 the entire press corps missed that. Well, and, and in fact, in a way, this was a repeat of of uh, the first Gulf War. I mean, when, when George Herbert Walker Bush, after April Gillespie, told Saddam Hussein that he could take back the 57th state, as I recall, which is what Kuwait used to be. It used to be a district of Iraq, um, you know, because they were slant drilling and stealing Iraq's oil, and Saddam was appropriately, I think, uh, upset about that. Uh, as soon as he invaded Iraq, George Herbert Walker Bush was also looking at his own re-election in 1992 and said, you know, okay, we'll have a war, and, but, you know, it, it's not going to be a quagmire. I don't want to have a Vietnam kind of war here. We're just going to have a, a little war like Ronald Reagan had, and, and, of course, Bush was the vice president for that little war with Grenada. And, but, you know, we've got to convince people that there's a reason for it. So they get this woman who is the daughter of a, a Kuwaiti diplomat to come in and lie about how the soldiers are throwing children in uh, incubators, you know, on the on the floors of hospitals, and everybody's right. horrified. And and you know, again, we buy a BS story that is not, you know, the intelligence was not lying to us. I think in either case, the politicians were lying to us. Isn't that pretty much what happened? I mean, a little bit of both. I think if you look back at the history of the Iraq War, you'll find that the 
like for instance, the British intelligence dossier, which was the first one that was released, was was quite heavily edited. I mean, they they yeah. originally came to the conclusion that um, it, it, Saddam could never build a bomb if there was a ranch a sanctions regime in place. That if there wasn't, it would be at least five years. And they they originally edited it down to one year. Right. Uh, so so yeah, there was some. The, you know what they call stovepiping going on, basically where um, the higher officials like Bush and Cheney were sort of reaching down into the raw data and taking what they wanted. Um, but you know the, the larger issue was it was it was the intellectual context within which all this was sold. It, it was the idea that you know not only do they have weapons, but that containment doesn't work that uh, Iraq was an exceptional threat compared to countries like Libya and North Korea and Iran. Um, all of these things were falsehoods that, that kind of had to be smoothed over in the initial planning. And the journalists bought it all ho wholesale, whereas the public initially reacted with quite appropriate skepticism. That's why there were millions of people on the street. The largest demonstrations in the history of the planet were the anti-war demonstrations against going into Iraq in uh, in the winter of 2003, as I recall. That's um, right. The February 15, 2003 demonstration was the largest demonstration in history. Yeah. And what's amazing about that is, that, you know, I was one of the people marching that day. Me too. And and you know, nobody in the crowd was like, gee, I really don't think they have the weapons of mass destruction. The, the, the tenor of those demonstrations was they're lying to us about everything. You know, right. I mean, like the whole pretext is wrong. Like none of it makes sense. Well, and there's sense. there's another piece to this, Matt, that people were pointing out. I was uh, actually on that on that day, uh, Mark Crispin Miller and I were giving a speech in a church in Seattle and we had like, you know, it seems like a thousand people. And it was spilling out into the streets. And then, of course, it went out into the streets. Um, and and my recollection of that speech, uh, you know, that I gave at the time, was that in asking the question, why is it that we keep invading countries uh, that have oil? You know, at, at that time, Iraq was, right. you know, Dick Cheney had just said Iraq had the second largest supply of oil in the world. Now we know that, uh, well, and Libya has a massive supply of oil, so we went and we bombed the crap out of, Il of Libya and, and decapitated uh, uh, Gaddafi. And now, now we're learning that the largest, the single largest reserve of oil on Earth, it's not the, the sweet crude that we prefer, but is in Venezuela, apparently. Right. And right. so, gee, it's not just that we keep overthrowing governments, it's that we keep overthrowing governments that have, you know, the within the top three amounts of oil on Earth. Right, yeah, and and, and we're, we're, we're going into places that have economic slash strategic importance to us. They're not telling us the real reason. I mean, there's, there's a whole host of sort of interconnected uh, financial and bureaucratic motives. Oil, the oil was certainly part of the picture, and the public, I think, quite quite rightly sniffed that out from from the very beginning. Um, you know, we we all recognized that that the the explanations they were giving us for for why we were going in didn't make any sense. And what's so amazing about that is. You know, the only news organization, the major, only major one in America that didn't go along with this was the Knight Ritter News Service. So that tells you that, you know, we're, we're journalists, our job is to be the tougher sell, right? Yeah. Like, we're, we're supposed to be the people who are harder to fool. Oh, journalists are, are supposed to be professional skeptics. I mean, it's, it's, exactly. it's journalism 101, you know? So, right, but they but right. they failed to do that. Matt, we, we just have a couple of minutes left. So what what do we do about all this? And what do we do about how badly we're getting ripped off by the Pentagon? You know, it's it's really hard to say. I think the the the, the problem with both of these issues, and especially with the the, the Pentagon, is that you're never going to fix the issue of of uh, foreign adventurism and the continually escalating defense budget until you deal with campaign finance. Because what happens is the the weapons manufacturers just just dominate the appropriations and armed services committees, which means you can never threaten. To withdraw their funding right. uh, for anything, so I think that's that's thing number one. People need to realize that until they get that under control, nothing is going to change. And thing number two, I mean, 
I think the thing number two that people talked about with the Pentagon, you know, when I did the story about how they failed their audit, they delayed for 30 years a congressionally mandated audit. Right. The Pentagon, you're never going to know exactly where all the money is until they have a, a modern, integrated accounting system that is that goes throughout the entire system. Right now, the, the military is divided into multiple fiefdoms. Each service has its own multiple accounting systems, and they're resisting sort of doing one big computerized accounting thing like you do in any big corporation. Right. I, I think I think they're 20 years away from doing that, which means that we have 20 more years of not knowing where the money goes. And in the meantime, as you documented in your article, uh, How to Blow $700 billion, you've got defense contractors that are double, double billing, uh, just as a matter of business practice. Oh, yeah. Hey, I got paid. Not bad. Um, oh, and, and all kinds a, of stuff. It's amazing. I talked to one Air Force accountant. He's like, and he was, he's telling me, you know, people honestly, contractors will honestly, you know, by accident, send an invoice to, to the Pentagon and just get paid. And, you know, then, he, then, he, then his take on it is work gets around. Like, if yeah. you know how to write an invoice to the Pentagon, the money's going to come, and and there's a million ways to rip off the system, and they don't. They have like 200 people watching all this money. That's you know, it's ridiculous. There's right. there's more enforcement officers in the NYPD. It's it's absurd. Right, and this is nearly a trillion dollars a year. It's mine. It's seven tenths of a trillion dollars a year, and 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 then and then there's also the issue, and we just have 30 seconds, Matt. That that um, about half the Pentagon's budget, I understand, has actually been privatized. It's going to private corporations to begin with. Well, yeah, that's that's probably roughly about right. I mean, you know, the 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 problem is they the the big five defense contractors, which I think is you know off the top of my head, it's Lockheed Martin, Boeing. Um, I, I forget what the what the other yeah. three are, but but you know, they they take up something like thirty five percent of the budget on their own. Wow! And be, and because because they have so much power. You, you can't withhold money from them because they just have so much So it's, it gets back to money and politics. They, the, the corporations are lobbying the politicians at the same time that the Pentagon is putting pressure on them.